Just before we get started with the video today, I do want to say that it's brought to you by Lucy. Go to lucy.co and use the promo code MEGAPROJECTS for 20% off your order today. More about them in a bit. The large majority of American mega projects that we've spoken about on this channel are on the East Coast, the Empire State Building, the Pentagon, and the Twin Towers, for example. However, today we're discussing the most iconic structure in the Western United States, the Golden Gate Bridge. Located on the edge of San Francisco, the massive bridge is famous for its unique orange color and decorative aspects. But beyond its iconic image, it was also immensely practical. Despite all that, the world didn't actually know of the men responsible for designing it until a couple of decades ago. And according to current estimates, it may be just sheer luck that it's never collapsed during an earthquake. But one thing is for sure, it's a sight to behold. So let's get started. San Francisco sits on the tip of a small peninsula, creatively named the San Francisco Peninsula. One mile across the water from San Francisco on the California mainland is Marin County. This one mile wide strait is called the Golden Gate as it leads from the endless Pacific Ocean to a complex of bays, the largest of which is called the San Francisco Bay, again creative. San Francisco has been a population center for well over a century, but there isn't a ton of habitable land in the city itself. The mid-19th century ushered in the California Gold Rush and the Bay Area's population ballooned. Within San Francisco, the number of residents tripled in the 10 years from 1850 to 1860, from 49,000 to 150,000. While San Francisco was and still is the economic center for the region, many of the town's workers lived across the strait in Marin County. Following the population boom, the first consistent ferry service was established in 1867 by the Sausalito Land and Ferry Service. The trip across the strait took about 30 minutes, but the boat's limited capacity slowed workers' flow into the city. Around this time, the area's most ambitious thinkers proposed building a bridge across the Golden Gate, but the idea was cast aside as impossible and preposterous. After all, the 2,000-meter Golden Gate Strait was known for its inhospitable conditions, like 97 km an hour winds, thick fog, and a seafloor over 100 meters deep. By the 20th century, though, attitudes began to change. San Francisco was continuing to grow, but the lack of easy access was stunting that growth. It became the largest city in America to rely on a ferry for such a considerable portion of its workforce. In 1916, the bustling town hosted a World's Fair marked by ambitious futuristic proposals on developing the city. With this aura of creative ambition in full swing, a man named James Wilkins published an op-ed in the local paper calling for the city to finally take the plunge and build the bridge. San Francisco's city engineer looked into the scheme and estimated that the cost would exceed $100 million, which is $2.3 billion in 2020, which is far, far from a feasible budget. But he also requested proposals from anyone who could conceive of a more cost-efficient design. The call for input caught the attention of a man named Joseph Strauss, an ambitious engineer who wrote poetry in his free time. Strauss was no stranger to designing massive bridges, as for his master's thesis, he developed a plan for an 89-kilometer bridge to cross the Bering Strait. While that design was obviously never built, you would know about that, he had successfully completed about 400 bridges through the US, most of which were smaller-scale drawbridges. Strauss's design would cut costs by more than half, so he was selected as the project architect under the stipulation that he would work with a team of engineers who were more experienced with such large-scale projects. But while the plan was now set in motion, the battle for building the bridge was just beginning. Strauss would spend the next decade growing support for the bridge and facing opposition from all directions. The US Navy and the Department of War worried that the bridge would affect ship traffic or even become a target for bombings, which would cut off the Navy's ships in the Bay Area from the Pacific Ocean. The Southern Pacific Railroad was perhaps the most influential opponent as they operated the local ferry service. Local environmentalists argued that the bridge would ruin the area's natural beauty, and other locals feared the tax implications of such an expensive project. Working in and these foes almost succeeded in blocking the bridge's construction, but Strauss put up a bite and found support wherever he could. He filled the newspapers with op-eds and traveled throughout Northern California to speak to labor unions, booster clubs, and politicians. One of Strauss's most important allies was the growing automobile industry, which saw the bridge as a critical step in convincing locals to splurge on cars. By the late 1920s, the project was officially approved and the land was granted for the structure. But the fight it still wasn't over. The next step was financing the project, and the timing couldn't have been worse. 
With the stock market crash of October 1929 came the Great Depression, and money for financing the project was suddenly lost. California's government approved the issuance of $30 million worth of bonds the following year, which would be almost half a billion dollars today, but nobody was willing to put forward that amount of money. After two years of traveling the country, getting rejected by financiers, Strauss was on his last leg. So he turned to Amadeo Giannini, the president of Bank of America and a longtime resident of San Francisco. Strauss pleaded with Giannini, claiming that the state would scrap the project if they didn't have the funding soon. His appeal works with Giannini and Bank of America buying all of the bonds supposedly in an attempt to reinvigorate the local economy. Finally, after 15 years of planning, pleading, and peddling, the Golden Gate Bridge had a clear path forward. Now, just before we continue along that path, let me put in a quick word for today's fantastic sponsor, Lucy. So who is Lucy? Well, it's more like a what is Lucy. It's a nicotine gum. And you might be thinking right now, wait, nicotine gum? It's not 1997, Simon. But, well, au contraire, my friends. I mean, it's not 1997, but nicotine gum, let me tell you about it. One of the smells of my childhood is actually nicotine gum, as my dad smoked and he used nicotine gum to give up. But it was a weird smell. I can remember him saying that it didn't taste good at all, but you know, it did help him give up smoking, so that's a good thing. But that was back in the day, that was the mid 90s. So Lucy's on that same mission today. They're providing a cleaner nicotine alternative through their revolutionary new gum. Lucy was started by two Caltech scientists that felt the traditional products weren't speaking to their generation and they aren't as satisfying as they could be. Two years of reformulation and they have created a longer lasting and better experience gum that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, pomegranate, and cinnamon. Lucy's mission is to reduce tobacco related harm to zero. Boy is that ambitious by creating a future where nicotine products can satisfy adult tobacco users without tobacco. Look, we all know that smoking is bad for you and that is why Lucy created a product that allows you to get the buzz you're looking for without the tobacco. That's Lucy, L-U-C-Y dot co or just click the link below and make sure you use the code Mega projects for 20% off. Now, a little disclaimer warning this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Apart from his role as the man who got the Golden Gate Bridge approved and financed, Strauss was also the project's chief engineer. However, this may have been little more than a title. Strauss's plan was chosen because it was so much cheaper than the city government projected, but it turned out that the city board wasn't actually a fan of his design. His first mock-up included two double cantilever spans connected by a central suspension segment, and this was rejected because it was apparently too ugly. So despite Strauss's title, many modern historians and engineers claim that the bridge was mostly designed by three other men. The first was an engineer named Leon Moiseff, who was most notable for his work on the Manhattan Bridge in New York. Moiseff was the leading proponent of building a large suspension bridge, an ambitious decision in and of itself as no suspension bridge had ever crossed such a large body of water. Moiseff was attached to the project early on as the city board felt his vision was much more visually pleasing. Another key contributor was Irving Morrow, an architect who had spent most of his career planning residential spaces. Though Morrow was something of an unknown at the time, he contributed most of the details that made the bridge such an icon. Personal designing the shape of the bridge's towers, their art deco elements, and the entire structure's lighting scheme. More importantly, he is the one who chose the bridge's color, thankfully rejecting a proposal by the US Navy to paint it black with yellow stripes. Finally, Moisef's right-hand man was an engineer named Charles Ellis. Though not credited with the title, Ellis is considered by most people to have been the project's principal engineer. This meant that he was responsible for the bridge's overall structural design, including dealing with the intense winds that flooded through the Golden Gate. Despite or perhaps because of assembling this dream team, tensions between the men were often high. Strauss's ego, which had been so essential for getting the project approved, made it difficult for him to give up so much control. He suffered from bouts of paranoia, often theorizing that the three men were conspiring to get him removed from the project. Eventually, Strauss fired Ellis when he uncovered that the man had communicated with Moisef, who, remember, was Ellis's supervisor behind his back. Despite his firing, Ellis continued to contribute 70 hours a week for the following years before transitioning to academia and becoming a global authority on structural design. However, one nasty part of Strauss's attitude revealed itself in his ability to credit anyone else for their contributions. Following the bridge's completion, Strauss was celebrated as a local hero, with the city erecting a large statue of the man. The rest of the team received little to no credit whatsoever. Not until the late 20th century did historians reveal that Strauss's contributions were mostly limited to getting the project approved. Now, Ellis, Moisev, and Morrow are recognized as crucial contributors alongside Strauss in design and building the Bay Area icon.
Construction finally began on the bridge on January the 5th, 1933. Altogether, the bridge took just over four years to build, eventually finishing on May the 27th, 1937. The total cost was $35 million, $523 million today, placing it about $1 million under the original budget. It's unusual for a mega project. The builder's first task was to construct the anchorages for the two soaring towers that would bear most of the bridge's weight. The anchorage near San Francisco stood 305 meters from the coast, while the other was on Marin County shoreline. The two anchorages required workers to blast excavations in the straight sea floor and pump out 9.7 million gallons of water before pouring concrete to support the structures. Each of the two towers stands 227 meters, that's 746 feet, above the water, the tallest of any suspension towers until the Mezcala Bridge was completed in Mexico in 1993. At the top of each tower, embedded in concrete, are two main cables that run the bridge's entire length. Each of those two cables comprises exactly 27,572 strands of wire, or over 130,000 kilometers of wire. 250 pairs of vertical suspender ropes connect the wires to the bridge's roadway. While construction went relatively smoothly for the duration, there was one major accident. In the final year of building, a set of scaffold collapsed, killing 10 men. However, the project could have gone much worse if not for Strauss's contribution of placing safety netting beneath the scaffolds to catch falling workers. Believe it or not, this was considered a groundbreaking innovation at the time. The movable safety netting saved lives throughout the rest of the project, but in one circumstance, it was unable to bear the weight of the collapsing scaffolding. The bridge stands 67 meters, 220 feet above the water, and from abutment to abutment is over 2,700 meters long. Its main body is 1,300 meters, which gave it the title of world's longest suspension bridge until it was surpassed in 1964. Following the bridge's completion, a week of opening ceremonies began, marked by President Franklin Roosevelt sending a telegram to the world that the massive structure was finally opened. The celebration was raucous, with more than 200,000 people walking across the bridge on the first day of opening, and the people had much to celebrate. Though always a lovely and unique city, San Francisco had lacked a symbol of their stature. With the brightly colored Golden Gate Bridge, well, they had their icon. While the simple act of crossing the Golden Gate Strait was impressive in and of itself, the region's geography and climate forced the engineering team to overcome a few obstacles. The bridge was designed to safely withstand winds of up to 109 km an hour, but in 1951 the area was hit with 111 km an hour winds, forcing the bridge to shut down for the day. The windstorm revealed rolling instabilities and excessive swaying, which could lead to a complete collapse in the worst of circumstances. In fact, a suspension bridge in Tacoma, Washington, designed by Joseph Strauss, had collapsed collapsed from wind in 1940, less than six months after it had opened. So after seeing the excessive swaying, the bridge was reinforced with additional diagonal bracing on the trusses. Despite the additional reinforcement, the bridge has still been subject to shutdown for winds exceeding 109, closing briefly in December of 1982 and 1983 during brief periods of winds around 115 km an hour. In 2019, though, as part of a larger renovation project, many slats on the bridge's sides were retrofitted with more flexible materials, creating a more aerodynamic structure. Now the bridge can safely withstand winds up to 160 km an hour, 100 miles per hour, which has never been recorded in that area. Strangely enough, the only adverse effect of the new design is that the slats vibrate in strong winds, creating a humming noise loud enough to be heard by residents in Marin County across the bridge from San Francisco. The most significant complete renovation in the bridge's history came in the 1980s. As we mentioned, the Bay Area is notorious for its dense fog and mists, which carry corrosive salt water into the air. The Golden Gate Bridge's original deck was made of rebar-enforced concrete, which can cause corrosion, palling, and eventually rusting of the metal rebar when mixed in with salt water. Over four years, the entire bridge deck was replaced without ever shutting off traffic access. Instead of the rebar concrete, the workers installed steel orthotropic deck panels, which are 40% lighter, stronger, and more resistant to salt water. The project cost an estimated $68 million. The final significant engineering challenge was the bridge's location near the San Andreas Fault. This fault places the entire Bay Area in the middle of some of the world's hottest seismic zones. In fact, some seismologists predict that a long overdue superquake will hit the city in the coming decades. 
While the bridge was initially viewed as indestructible by earthquakes, it turned out this assumption was far from accurate. In fact, a 98-meter-high support arch on the San Francisco side of the bridge was vulnerable to collapse in the event of a large quake, but the city has been lucky to avoid such catastrophes in the years following the bridge's completion. A reinforcement project is underway currently and will soon surpass the surface upgrade as the most expensive project, coming in at almost half a billion dollars, though the project includes other components as well. Now, despite its beauty and its magnificence, the Golden Gate Bridge is is famous for one thing that can only be called a tragedy. It is the most frequently used suicide spot in the world. With most of the deck standing 75 meters above the water, jumpers fall for four seconds, often reaching alarming speeds of 120 kilometers an hour. At such high rates, most jumpers are killed on impact. After decades of debate, the addition of a suicide prevention net was finally approved. The net extends six meters off the bridge and is supported by stainless steel, effectively making it impossible for jumpers to reach the water. Though initially due for completion in 2019, the construction has been delayed by a shift in the contracting company's ownership. The net is now expected for completion in 2023. Altogether, the Golden Gate Bridge story is an odd one, perhaps reminiscent of the idiosyncratic city that calls it home. It remains a symbol of the distances that humankind can cross through creativity, ingenuity, and determination. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Lucy, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.